from Kona to Yanan, the political memoirs of Koji Ariyoshi. Chapter 15. Withdrawal. Months later, in Shantung province, I met a young college student who had joined a contingent. She told me that on the first day her unit covered 81 lai, 27 miles. She said the pace was the same every day. Then every night, dramatic corps of the army, including adolescents, put on skits in villages. Yangko, the folk dance of northwest China, which had spread the length and breadth of Yan'an territory, made a big hit with the peasants in newly liberated villages. Peasants learned the simple three steps and danced to the songs with a message for peace, democracy, land reform, lower taxes, clean government, and abundant production. This was something new to them, she explained, as the peasants had previously danced to the songs of and for the landlords. I don't think we have had anything like this in China. I could feel the songs and dances moving and stirring the peasants. They awaken the peasants who will someday be their own masters. And late into the night I listened to this youth from a middle-class home who had been served by servants all her life and who was being introduced to the Chinese countryside. She said the Chinese people now had hopes of a strong new China, where foreigners would stop pushing them around in their own city streets. I knew she was speaking the thoughts of many. Toward the middle of September, Colonel Ivan D. Eaton, commanding officer of the U.S. Observer Mission in Yan'an, sent me to Chongqing to report our observations to General Albert Wedemeyer. At theater headquarters, I was surprised to discover that the strength of the communist-led forces was terribly underestimated. Many U.S. Army and some civilian officials in responsible positions felt Yan'an was weakened considerably because the Soviet Union had signed a pact with Chongqing. It was also said that Mao's trip to Chongqing had caused splits among Yan'an's top leadership. I was told by many that Chiang's forces would have the communist-led forces well in hand within three months. One afternoon I walked into General Wedemeyer's office where he was alone. He was most cordial and asked me to relax. He said he had many questions he wanted to ask me and he suggested that I feel free to express my observations in an informal manner. For a while I gave a thorough analysis of the strength of the communist-led peasant army. The general interrupted me to remind me that the nationalists had 19 American trained and equipped divisions. 20 more divisions would be brought up to this standard in the near future, he said. He also said Yan'an's troops were no match for nationalist soldiers. I asked the general, suppose, under the most favorable conditions, we were able to place Chiang's divisions in the exact positions the Japanese occupied, could his troops do half as well against partisans? I said the war records of both armies gave a good indication of their respective abilities. I discussed Yan'an's guerrilla warfare, which did not require extensive supply trains. The guerrillas lived off the land and fought with popular support. I also said the guerrillas would slash communication lines. They would force the nationalists to contend with their military tactics. And while politics was the Yan'an forces cutting edge, graft and corruption would weaken the nationalists. Eventually, heavy American equipment would become an encumbrance to the nationalists. U.S. supplied arms would pass into the hands of the Yan'an forces. The struggle would drag on into a bitter war of attrition. Chiang could never crush the guerrillas in three months. His corrupt regime would eventually crumble. What China needs is not nationalist domination but good clean government and democracy, I said. Such a government must be broadly representative. As the reporting continued, the general shot questions at me and asked me to answer in a few words. I could see that he was becoming progressively disturbed by the situation I described. Then he switched from military to political issues. I was not surprised when he said the Chinese Communist Party was split wide open. Rumors were prevalent in nationalist China, obviously fabricated for American consumption, that Mao Zedong had been repudiated for capitulating to Chiang's scheming invitation to discuss a phony peace. For about ten minutes I reported about the National Convention of the Chinese Communist Party held in Yan'an in the spring of 1945. The convention resulted in unity and strong support for Mao. The leaders had reviewed past policies and practices for many months and formulated a program behind which they stood. We talked for almost an hour, and more and more the general's expression became cloudy. Then suddenly he brought himself forward from his reclining position, wheeled his chair around so that he was sitting at his desk. He brusquely picked up a batch of reports and began to read, ignoring me altogether. Shall I leave, General Wedemeyer? I asked him, after what seemed to me a whole minute of silence. Without looking up, he said, yes. I stood up and went in front of his desk and saluted him, and when I reached the door he called, Ariyoshi, come back. Would I see Ambassador Hurley and report to him exactly what I had said to him? The general asked. He said that I should be forthright, without reservation, and not be afraid. I answered that I would report to the ambassador. Would the general make the appointment? He said he would. When I went to the U.S. Embassy a few days later, I was asked by one of the staff employees to go to the ambassador's bedroom upstairs. The ambassador told me he had been sick. 
He was freshening up for the day in his knee-length robe and stocking feet. I could not keep from smiling, for he lacked the color and air of dignity he had carried with him when I first saw him in Yanan. The ambassador had me sit on a chair by his bed. He instructed me to tell him what I had on my mind and walked to his dresser in the far corner of the room and carefully touched up his mustache in front of a mirror. I told him about General Wedemeyer's instructions and proceeded to give my report, the gist of which I felt the general must have conveyed to the ambassador in arranging my appointment. After I had said a few sentences, he interrupted me. What kind of radio equipment does Chu Te have? He asked me. I was about to answer him when he told me, young man, Chu Te got his radio sets from the Japanese. The Japanese gave them to him so that he wouldn't fight. Chu Te was bought. I am the man who knows. I said this was not correct, realizing how he felt about the whole China situation. I explained to him that I knew from personal knowledge that Michael Lindsay, a British economics professor who had escaped from Peking after Pearl Harbor, had repaired and rebuilt radios the guerrillas captured from the Japanese. Lindsay, son of a British baron, built sets from parts the communists bought or captured in Japanese-occupied territory. I have had considerable discussion with Lindsay and his Chinese wife, H. Sio Lai. After his father died last year, Lindsay inherited his father's title. The ambassador came toward me. Still in his robe, he towered above me. Leaning forward, he shook his finger in my face. Young man, Heskolded, you have been fooled by communist propaganda. I am the only American who has not been fooled by communist propaganda. The communists did not fight the Japanese. They are not as strong as their propaganda says. He seemed extremely bitter at Yanon's press, which attacked him as an American imperialist and warmonger. He said he had done nothing more than carry out Washington's directive to save China when General Joseph Stilwell and Vice President Henry Wallace had reported the nationalist government was tottering. He told me a story to illustrate how closely he followed instructions. In World War I, he said, he was ordered to cross a river in France with his battalion over a bridge. He said he did not ford the river where the enemy had not concentrated its forces, but crossed the river over the bridge in face of heavy enemy fire. He said he would not tolerate sabotage of American policy in China, and emphasized that he had removed Ambassador Gauss, General Stilwell, George Acheson, and others from the embassy. The ambassador said he had agents in Yan'an who reported to him directly. All private conversations held between Americans and Chinese communists were reported to him by Mao Zedong and Chu Enlai. He said, this was ridiculous, even from the point that a few moments before he was bitterly blasting Yan'an for criticizing him in its press. There might be others who might be knifing me in the back in Yan'an, the ambassador said. He said he would remove them. Don't forget, young man, he said, my knife cuts deeper than that of anyone in the war and state departments. To further clarify his point, he told me another story, this one about an Oklahoma cowboy. This cowboy was getting a shave in a barber shop when he heard shots outside. The barber became nervous and the cowboy quieted him down. A man then rushed into the barber shop and warned the cowboy that a young cowboy with a new pistol was gunning for him. The old cowboy did not hurry the barber. After the barber was through, he paid him and leisurely walked out into the deserted street. The younger cowboy shot until he emptied his pistol. Then the old cowboy drew out his pistol and fired one shot. The upstart fell in his tracks. Young man, the moral is, I can take a lot of sniping, but I shoot last. He complained that the OWI sent the daily worker to Yan'an and the communists used its articles to attack him. I said this wasn't true, that the OWI did not send the Daily Worker, although Yan'an had once requested it. But conservative and liberal publications were sent there, and some clippings from the American press complimented him. I added that Yan'an studied them carefully. All of a sudden, Ambassador Hurley beamed. I had not meant that the communists agreed with the articles which were laudatory of Hurley's work in China, but merely meant that they read them carefully. The ambassador was in good spirits and the interview ended. He had done all the talking. As soon as our plane came to a stop on my return to Yan'an, one of our officers from the U.S. observation mission boarded it and closed the door. I thought this was strange. He then briefed the transport's crew not to discuss politics or American military activities in nationalist China. I asked the officer what had caused this new security measure. The colonel doesn't want any loose talk, he explained. He told me that a crew from a transport told Yan'an's liaison officers connected to our mission that OSS agents were defending Kaifeng with Japanese and puppets against Yan'an's forces. Another crew had mentioned that the 315 troop carrier transport moved a nationalist fighter unit from Anqiang to H. Suchao. The fighters quickly started strafing Yan'an-held territory. When the communists hear stories like these, they surely get burnt up, he said to me. The colonel pondered whether we should take precautions against Chinese demonstrations and possible attack against our mission. We had code machines and documents to protect, he said. The officers who had been in Yan'an for many months did not think that we would be attacked. 
Yan'an was still cooperating, supplying us with weather reports. Weather in China moves from west to east. Ironically, meteorological reports sent from Yan'an to theater headquarters were being used in transporting Chiang Kai-shek's troops by air. Then early in October we were notified that an American fleet would land at the Yan'an liberated port of Shefu. The Chinese communists protested strongly through our mission. Theater headquarters notified us that our fleet was making a forced landing, if necessary, on October 10th. The colonel called me to his quarters for discussion. He finally decided to keep our personnel in our compound that day. He ordered me to have all firearms of American personnel locked up. On the morning of the Shefu landing, about which Yan'an did not know, the border region government invited us to attend a simple ceremony of the double tenth, October 10th, anniversary, to observe the birth of the Chinese Republic under Dr. Sun Yat-sen. We went to the border region headquarters to congratulate Chinese officials, but we did not stay long. We rushed back to our mission and anxiously waited for news from Shefu. It was a great relief when Vice Admiral Daniel E. Barbie, commander of the 7th Fleet, did not land at Shefu. He announced from his flagship off the Shefu Harbor that American forces will not land at Shefu, which is under the control of the Chinese communists. The result of the American landing here will have no other meaning than to help the central government troops to occupy the port. Such a move will become a direct intervention in Chinese internal affairs. The admiral's views clashed with those of General Wedemeyer. He went so far as to advise against transporting Chang's troops into Manchuria. Shortly after, Wedemeyer and Barbie went to General MacArthur's headquarters in Japan for a pow-wow. The admiral was relieved of Asiatic duty. I remember picking up a New York Times magazine section at Chabua, India, prior to flying over the hump into China during June, 1944. In an April 1942 edition, Madame Chiang Kai-shek had written an article that said, During the past five years there has been no instance of Chinese troops surrendering to the enemy. Yeah. To the Chinese soldier, resistance to the last cartridge and the last man is no mere pretty figure of speech. When our men go to the battlefield they are prepared to die. Their patriotism is fully shared by their families. Yeah. The word surrender is not to be found in the present-day Chinese vocabulary. I tucked this paper into my duffel bag and carried the article with me for many months. One day in Chongqing, I showed it to a young Chinese intellectual who worked for the OWI. He was surprised that the Americans believed the madam's propaganda utterances. A few days later, he came up to me with a bit of information which he thought might interest me. He said that back in 1942, during the same month Madame Chiang's article appeared in the Times, Kuomintang General Sun Liang Chen had surrendered to the Japanese in West Shantung with his 69th Army. The Japanese designated General Sun's unit the Puppet 2nd Front Army and made him commander. I learned also that from 1941 to the summer of 1944, more than 70 high-ranking Kuomintang generals had gone over to the Japanese with columns, divisions, or brigades. These units were not disorganized by the enemy but renamed and placed on Japan's anti-Yanon fronts. This fitted Chiang's plans. Chiang was trying to use more and more Japanese in the civil war against Yanon's forces, and Japanese commanders in one or two places pleaded with the Americans to accept their surrender. American Marines, in this situation, guarded railways with Japanese, Puppet, and Kuomintang troops. The Marines griped about this duty they were forced to perform side by side with their recent enemy, still fully armed. They rode coal trains with Chiang's soldiers through Yan'an-held territory. Occasionally villagers on Yan'an's side took pot shots at these trains. On October 30, 1945, General Albert Wedemeyer told the press, U.S. troops will not intervene directly in the Chinese Civil War because traditional U.S. policy holds that other nations will be permitted to choose their own form of government without foreign intervention. This was ridiculous talk, and American correspondents, who were not gagged as much as correspondents are today, made fun of General Wedemeyer. 50,000 U.S. Marines who had been brought to China, reportedly to help disarm the Japanese, were not executing their tasks. General Wedemeyer authorized air strafing of villages which did not heed ceasefire requests to let the trains go through. Against hostile villages he ordered adequate military action. Yan'an blasted him, saying it found the smell of gunpowder very pungent in his words. Then one day a U.S. Marine unit fired about a couple of dozen mortar shells into a village because the people there did not turn over to the Americans the Chinese who had shot at a U.S. guarded coal train. On one of my trips to theater headquarters I mentioned to General Wedemeyer that U.S. soldiers were guarding Chiang's trains passing through hostile territory. The general said that his foremost duty was to protect American soldiers, and he was forced to blow up the village when the villagers did not heed his request. 
When I mentioned that our troops were being sent into hostile territory, he said that without U.S. assistance, Chiang could not transport necessary coal to the cities. The colonel under whom I served was extremely loyal to the general, and he constantly said that the general was not getting a good press. It was bad enough that Yan'an attacked the general in its news broadcasts. He said, when General Wedemeyer denied that we were intervening, Yan'an asked what would be the general's reaction if Yan'an's troops landed on the west coast and occupied Yosemite Park and other places. So when the colonel sent me to report to the general in November 1945, one mentioned the general's press statements. The general was bitter at some correspondence. He felt he was put in a tough situation. He said the general staff in Washington instructed him to hold press conferences and so he had to meet the press. The newspaper reporters asked him many questions. He said he answered freely, taking the correspondence into his confidence. The next thing he knew he was criticized for his statements, he explained. All these things when added up indicated that the policy of supporting Chiang to crush Yan'an's forces was a flop. I talked to high American officers in headquarters who back in September had believed Chiang would have the Yan'an forces licked within three months. They were now disgusted with Chiang's forces. In this situation, the U.S. held the balance between civil war and peace in China. Continued U.S. military support of Chiang's corrupt regime was no solution to China's problems. This meant civil war when China needed democracy and a firm economic foundation. Even the people in Shanghai who had welcomed the Kuomintang as liberators were saying a few months later that the Japanese had been much better. Terrible inflation and unemployment, besides graft, corruption and bad and inefficient government, had made them lose heart in Chiang, whose colossal portrait decorated a side of a building on a main thoroughfare. General Wedemeyer said that Chiang's trusted subordinates kept the truth from him. I hardly thought so, particularly after reading Chiang's telegram to Mayor Qin Tachan of Shanghai, dated October 26, saying, It has been reliably brought to my knowledge that the military, political and party officials in Nanking, Shanghai, Peiping and Tainzhen have been leading extravagant lives, indulging in prostitution and gambling, etc., etc. Now General Wedemeyer seemed more willing to accept a critical appreciation of Chiang's government and military forces. One afternoon I reported to General Wedemeyer and his immediate staff, including a general, Francis G. Brink. General Brink, I believe, is same person who recently, 1952, committed suicide in the Pentagon building. He was in charge of the warfare in Vietnam on the American side, and it was reported that he had appeared dejected. In this session there was no more talk about the big split in Yan'an's leadership or of 39 U.S. trained divisions under Chiang who would crush the Yan'an forces in three months. In September, when I had reported to General Wedemeyer, what I said was not the kind of information and analysis that he wanted to hear. I gave nearly the same report and he and his staff officers asked numerous questions, as though going over me with a fine-toothed comb. Finally one of them asked, what if the U.S. threw her full force unconditionally on Chiang's side? I discussed the growing chorus of protests in the U.S. against intervention. Would the people oppose, remain silent, or support such a military adventure, which would involve our country in years of warfare? The Japanese troops bogged down in China. They lived off the land. How much better could white soldiers in blockhouses in the Chinese countryside do? And exposed to constant guerrilla action for months and months. At this session I recall we disagreed on this point. The generals felt the GIs could crush Yan'an's forces in short order. I reminded them that in September they had told me that Chiang's forces could do that in three months. Chiang's weakness became more apparent in the face of mass opposition to civil war and U.S. intervention. All this drew Washington's closer attention. Four generals from Washington visited Shanghai. I was instructed to brief them in the Air Corps map room. A G-2 lieutenant colonel gave an optimistic picture of Chiang's strength and potentialities. I analyzed Chiang's weaknesses in the face of Yan'an's economic, military, political and cultural operations. Civil war was unpopular, and the Chinese generally blamed Chiang and the United States for denying them peace. At about this time, Ambassador Patrick J. Hurley resigned. This came one day, November 26, after six congressmen introduced resolutions calling for the withdrawal of U.S. troops, transports, and supplies. They urged that the U.S. use her efforts to bring about a coalition government based on popular land, tax, and government reforms. Mounting anti-civil war protests in China and the U.S. gave Hurley no other choice. General George C. Marshall succeeded Hurley. On December 15, 1945, President Truman made a policy statement that said, The United States is cognizant that the present nationalist government of China is a one-party government and believes that peace, unity, and democratic reform in China will be furthered if the basis of the government is broadened to include other political elements in the country. United States support will not extend to United States military intervention to influence 
influence the course of any Chinese internal strife. And as China moves toward peace and unity along the lines described above, the United States would be prepared to assist the national government in every reasonable way. The day this statement was made, the President sent General George C. Marshall to China to mediate between Yan'an and Chongqing. And when Tai arrived in Shanghai, several thousand students marched toward the airport to welcome him and to ask him to help bring peace rather than civil war in China. The students were sidetracked, beaten, and their leaders were jailed by Chang's gendarmes. The gendarmes quickly gathered another group to welcome General Marshall, but without the anti-civil war and peace slogans. On that day, I went around Shanghai to gather the story of the beatings. The demand for peace was popular. The president's statement of non-support to Chiang until peace, unity, and democratic reform took place in China meant practically nothing, for the U.S. kept supplying and training Chiang's army, navy, and air force. Peace-loving Chinese were all concerned. The Marshall mission was bound to fail. Just before I was separated from the army in China, I made a trip to Chongqing to report my observations to General Marshall. He was not a hurly, bombastic and egotistical, but quiet, always formulating his short, precise questions with care. He drew you out and listened. Once as a Chinese waiter came to the table, the general motioned to me with his hand to stop talking. As the waiter walked away, he motioned for me to continue. One of the waiters there was the chief waiter at the U.S. enlisted men's mess hall during the war, and I had always suspected him as a Thai Lai agent. He stood around the dining room tables, apparently picking up information. When I flew back to Shanghai, I arrived there right after the GI We Want to Go Home demonstration which greeted Secretary of War Patterson. A usually well-informed Chinese mentioned to me that after Secretary Patterson's departure, General Wedemeyer made a most significant statement to his staff. According to this Chinese source, the general had said that President Truman and Secretary of State Bynes were very much concerned with the spread of communism in the world, and that U.S. troops were in China to keep it from spreading there. If our troops did not remain in China, we would be paying lip service to the United Nations. Furthermore, the success of Marshall's mission depended on the presence of American forces in China. I checked up with American officers and discovered the Chinese had the correct information. I believe the Kuomintang already had this juicy intelligence. If they believed it, they would not take Marshall's mediation seriously. They would depend on U.S. support, for Chiang and his clique believed that the United States needed an alliance with the Kuomintang in carrying out a get-tough-with-Russia policy. And in a war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, which Chiang evidently wanted, he felt he could crush the Yan'an-led opposition. At least the Kuomintang leaders expected the U.S. to help them to defeat Yan'an. The GIs wanted no part in a civil war, and they had demonstrated. A few days later, on January 13 and 14, 1946, tens of thousands of students carrying placards passed in front of the United States Army headquarters, shouting, Stop Civil War! We want peace! And lonely GIs, go home! I watched one parade from the G2 office. A colonel told us that instructions had gone out that U.S. ships in the harbor would sound their sirens in case of trouble. The sirens were to be the signal for U.S. servicemen to rush to the headquarters building. On January 15th, another 100,000, this time workers, marched the same route, shouting the same slogans. This demonstration made the U.S. military brass hats gnash their teeth in helplessness and seething anger. Toward the end of March 1946, we prepared to close our United States Army Observer Section in Yan'an. Colonel Ivan D. Eaton, the commanding officer, was holding his last inspection. I had already been separated from the Army and was a cultural and information officer of the State Department. I saw the officers making a last-minute checkup of caves, latrines, and shower room. The shower room was still not clean so an officer became annoyed. He rushed to a teenage Chinese orderly who was sweeping up leaves on the ground. He told the orderly in English to clean up the shower room right away. The orderly said in Chinese he would not. Yes, you will. Now none of that sassy comeback. The lieutenant scolded in English. He grabbed the unwilling orderly by the back of the collar and tried to pull him to the shower room. While they were struggling, a Chinese liaison officer came to ask what was the matter. The officer said the orderly would not obey him. The orderly said the shower room was not his detail. The orderly who was responsible for cleaning the shower room was still cleaning a latrine. He says it's not his responsibility, the liaison officer explained. Well, make him clean it. We got inspection coming up in a few minutes. Don't you have discipline around here? The lieutenant shouted. The liaison officer tried to persuade the orderly, who still said no. He then explained to the lieutenant that the orderly was within his rights. However, he added, in the next criticism meeting this matter would be discussed. Oh, God, the lieutenant said, and rushed to clean the shower room himself. The orderlies were called Chao Tai Yun or man who looked after guests. We had never been permitted to call them boy, as orderlies were called in nationalist China. 
These orderlies were sons of poor peasants, and many were orphans who had attached themselves to the army in their early teens. Each one of them proudly carried a pencil and a notebook in his pocket. They had study hours, which included current events discussions. They had meetings frequently, and I used to see youngsters chairing their evening sessions in orderly manner in their courtyard. My first child, Tai Yuan, studied English in his spare time. He had a Chinese primary education through the army. When Chin Han, which was his name, left us, he became a clerk at the border region government. A Japanese prisoner once told me, these peasant children will be good leaders. Until the 8th Route Army came, they did not have opportunities. They are pure and unspoiled. The first words they learn are, for example, new democracy, land reform, interest reduction, and so on. They become class conscious very early. They are the most loyal to Mao Zedong's new democracy. The communist army is their parent and family. I met youths with an entirely different background when I traveled on in UNRRA, United Nations Rehabilitation and Relief Association, truck in 1946 from Peking to Kalgan. At the Great Wall I saw nationalist guards and gendarmes closely examining all the youths, who were generally clad in rags or faded old clothes and soiled like young farmhands. The guards with bayonet stopped wagons and ordered one or two youngsters riding on them to get down. They felt the hands of the boys and girls and if their hands were soft, they were taken down the line to headquarters. Everyone knew that unlucky ones who were caught ended up in one of Chiang Kai-shek's concentration camps. Middle or high school students in China then came from middle class or rich families, and since servants looked after them and they did not work, their hands were soft and without calluses. Middle class hands, a gendarme told us, are not easy to disguise, although in general appearance a young student might cleverly camouflage himself with old clothing bought or borrowed from a laborer or peasant family. The city bred people have had difficulties in adjusting to the countryside. Lin Chin, my interpreter in Yan'an, told me of his experiences after he fled Peking under Japanese occupation. He entered Lion Ho University in the Gorilla area and studied with about a thousand students. He said students had to borrow wash basins from peasants. Many peasants knew very little about sanitation, he said, and they spoke a different dialect. The students were like foreigners among them. The students had the additional hardship of being forced to do everything for themselves, whereas in Peking, servants looked after their needs. Also, food was of an inferior quality in guerrilla areas. My real test came when I was put in contact with peasants. My prejudice gradually disappeared. I learned their problems and their habits and later on, I enjoyed living with them, he said. And becoming familiar with their ways, he was in a position to teach them reading and writing and discuss current events with them. Lin Chin asked me to look up his brothers and sisters who had been scattered by the war. In Kalgan, the gateway to Inner Mongolia, I met his brother, who was an interpreter for UNRRA and U.S. Truce team members. His sister was an advisor of women students at the North China Associated University. Lin's brother and sister in turn asked me to look up their youngest sister if I should travel south along the coast in Kiangsu or Anhui provinces. A few weeks later I met Lin's youngest sister in central China. When I told her Lin Chin had asked me to see her, she said she did not know of a person named Lin Chin. Then I mentioned the names of her sister and brother in Kalgan. Tell me how they look. Lin Tung smiled. By your description I can tell whether they are my brothers and sister. But they look just like you, I insisted. Then they must have changed their names, she smiled. Someday we'll all be able to use our real names. Now, we must protect our own families in the cities who will suffer if the Kuomintang find out we are in the liberated areas. She said she had not met her brothers and sisters for nearly ten years. She was extremely proud of her family. Her father had been a public official of the Manchu dynasty. But we children are different. We work for the people. This 23-year-old political officer emphasized. In the evenings she came by to invite me for short walks in the town of H. Wayne. She was now a newspaper reporter. During the war she had carried a flatbed mimeograph machine on her back. She had moved around with guerrilla units and issued news bulletins to soldiers every five days. She said when the Japanese launched mopping up operations she had to be on the go all the time. When it rained and there was no shelter, she leaned against walls, trees or anything upright and went to sleep with the mimeograph well covered on her back. If she found rocks, she piled them and stood on them to keep her feet out of the puddles. She told me of how she had gone into Japanese-occupied villages to organize resistance forces by conducting winter schools or night schools. The peasants helped me to escape many times, she said. I am short so even if the puppets fired at me, I offered a small target. And she laughed. In the next minute she was telling me of her ambition of wanting to continue her studies so that she could help her people. Personal advancement seemed a consideration she had dropped by the wayside long ago.
peace, she said, is what the Chinese people yearn for. In a way she reminded me of Chuye, whom I met in Ngachuang, a village outside Lin'ai, Shantan province. She had a sweet, childish face and wore black cotton slacks and blouse. All she had in her small, one-room mud hut with a dirt floor was a stool, a makeshift table, and a plank board bed laid over with a thin cotton mattress. She too was from the city, from a middle-class home. She was working with the peasants in the field, effectively helping them organize for greater production and teaching them in spare time to read and write and keep accounts. She too talked of the people and spoke of the future with confidence, of a China prosperous and independent. In 1946 I made one last trip to Kalgan and H. Suen HWA, medium-sized cities which the Japanese had industrialized on the border of Inner Mongolia. Americans in Peking and Shanghai had asked me after I had made my first trip there whether the communist-led governments which had operated for years in the countryside could run modern industrial cities. The coal mines were working at greater efficiency than when I had visited them a month before. An iron foundry, with four blast furnaces in H. Su and HWA, was under repair. Factories producing matches, tobacco, rubber, vegetable oil and other products were going almost at full capacity. On my first trip to Kalgan I saw a paper factory which was under construction. When I visited Kalgan a month later, this factory was producing newsprint. On my first trip to Kalgan I was awakened every morning by loud drum beats and clashing of cymbals. This was election campaign week, during which time education and dramatic groups from schools and every mass organization went out on the streets to interest the populace in the election. Teenagers with makeup on and in costumes danced the popular Yang Ko, a folk dance. As dancers went up and down streets, the people gathered. Then someone with a pail of water sprinkled the ground to keep the dust down. The dramatic groups formed a circle right there in the street and put on short skits. Songs emphasized election of good, responsible people. When a large gathering filled the street, the youngsters stopped dancing. They faced the crowd from inside the circle and gave short talks on the responsibility of each citizen to exercise his franchise. They urged everyone on that street to study the candidates whose names were posted on a blackboard at the street entrance. On a back street we heard Ho Ta Ma, who was more popularly known as the mother of the 8th Route Army. Her speeches were short. She spoke about 10 sentences and ended with, I have the interest of the people at heart. She received the best response from her people. A liaison officer who was standing by me said she would get elected to the city council because she had helped wounded and sick soldiers during the anti-Japanese militarist resistance as though they were her sons. I asked him if Ho Ta Ma could read and write. The officer looked at me as though I had asked a stupid question. We believe in democracy. Our government is not a monopoly of the landlords and the merchants, he said. We have them, too, but we also have people like Mother Ho to represent the common people. And he added that Mother Ho had been deprived of opportunities to acquire a formal education. Later on that day Liu Tsn Kai, chief of the OWI Chinese division in Shanghai, who accompanied me on this trip to Kalgan, started a conversation with a merchant who was listening to a campaign speech. Liu asked the merchant about the election. Boss and T this something new in China. Was it fairly done? Without turning to look at Liu, the merchant said casually as he puffed on his long pipe. It seems now the toilers have their chance. Up to now, they had nothing to do with government. One month later the election was in full swing. Schools were closed and students were canvassing and participating in elections, as were workers during their noon break and after working hours. The students told me that this was the practical side of their education. Kalgan was really in a carnival spirit. I had never seen an election popularized for the people to this extent. Illiteracy, prevalent among the majority of peasants, was no bar to voting. At one booth I saw a voter dropping beans in jars placed behind candidates who faced the wall in a curtained-off area. I still remember the words of Dr. Sidney Y which I wrote down carefully in the early summer of 1946 when I was traveling in the Kyangsu Anhui border region. We conversed in English. Dr. Y is a graduate of Oberlin College and took his doctorate in political science and education at the University of Chicago. He had once been a secretary to Dr. Sun Yat-sen, and like many followers of the great leader he was opposed to the Chiang regime. He was vice chairman of the Kyangsu Anhui border region government. Dr. Y said to me, the Chinese people are very sensitive to foreign intervention. From students to illiterate peasants, by everyone in China, intervention will be understood, no matter under what guise it comes. On this score, the illiterate Chinese understand better than well-educated Americans. Imperialists and their Chinese running dogs have plagued China too long. Dr. Y was one of the last persons I spoke to in the liberated areas under the Yan'an administration before I left China in July 1946. Speaker T. Yin Feng of the People's Political Council of the same border region was another. The spirit of Dr. Sun Yat-sen lives with people like us, Speaker T. Yin Feng told me. The 72-year-old official had been a colleague of Dr. Sun. 
He said people like him and Madame Sun Yat-sen belonged to the old and genuine Kuomintang. The Kuomintang of Chiang Kai-shek had perverted Dr. Sun's three people's principles and his three great policies. The former he described as democracy, national independence, and improvement of people's livelihood. The three policies he said were cooperation with the Soviet Union, cooperation with the communists to resist imperialism, and supporting the interests of the workers and peasants. As I listened to Speaker T. Yin Feng, I realized that men like him, who called themselves liberals in China, read and studied Marxism just as they did the writings of Chinese scholars and philosophers. Students did likewise in Kuomintang territory where Chang's gendarmes enforced thought control. They took up competing philosophies and sifted the contents in their minds. Ti Yinfeng said that the people will decide what is best for them. Xiang, with all his soldiers, gendarmes, concentration camps, informers and courts, failed to hold down the people. I recalled what an Indian student told me months before in Calcutta as Speaker Ti Yinfeng related his thoughts to me, his face glowing in the flickering light. You Americans as a nation are highly literate, but your ignorance is surprising, the Indian had said. He was right. We generally shy away from serious subjects. Our schools help to develop this tendency. And here was Speaker T. In, his mind open and active. He had lived under the warlords Yuan Shikai and Chan. They certainly had given him no liberal influence. My tour of China was about over. The morning after my talk with Speaker T. In, I flew out of the liberated area for the last time. I looked down on the panorama which is the land of China's peasantry. Down there on both sides of the truce lines, peasants in uniform faced each other with captured Japanese and American military equipment in their hands. On one side stood Yan'an's troops with popular support. On the other side, the Kuomintang troops sat out the truce with American support. This land below us was a tobacco road, but it was transforming through the struggles of the people. Long ago, in poor sharecropper areas of Georgia, I wondered how the white and negro farmers could lift their living standards. They were divided and pitted against each other by Jim Crowism. Here, the land problem was being solved. In the rural areas of northern China, the peasants were organized. They were breaking away from the traditions of their ancestors, who lived isolated, ignorant lives. The peasants among whom I moved in the liberated and guerrilla areas stirred and pressed for a change for the better. They became owners of their land, with government support. They had leadership in Mao Zedong and in the young city intellectuals and students who went to them, studied their age-old problems, and helped them lick them. I arrived in Shanghai one week after a mass student anti-civil war demonstration. 50,000 students had sent off to Nanking a delegation of YWCA, bank, merchant, school, and other representatives to petition General Marshal, Chiang Kai-shek, and Chu Enlai to stop civil war. These businessmen and scholars, including my friend Mrs. Kitty Yen, who represented the YWCA, were beaten up by Kuomintang's secret police and ruffians at Nanking. These delegates were not communists but liberals and conservatives. The assault against communists had, like in Germany and Japan, turned into attacks against all opposition. When Sunday arrived there was talk of another demonstration. Since these demonstrations took on an anti-American slant, GIs were instructed not to go out on the streets. In their barracks and hotel rooms, the Americans waited all day for it to take place. There was no parade. I spent part of the day with my superior and discussed with him the Yang Kao case. Yang Kao, a Chinese liberal, had been an employee of the OWI office in Fujian. While carrying out his duties as news and information worker for the U.S. government, he became a suspect of the gendarmerie of a reactionary regional commander of Chiang Kai-shek. The gendarmes demanded that the Americans turn him over to them. Yang pleaded with his OWI superiors to give him protection, for he knew he would be killed by Chiang's police. The American in charge of the Fukian OWI office finally gave Yang to the secret police. But not all Americans crawled before the Kuomintang Gestapo. Edward Roabout, OWI news editor at Fukian and now of the Honolulu record staff, protested this arrest. When Yang was taken away, he headed for the Kuomintang prison to demand Yang's release. He was refused. For one week he carried out a sit-down strike in the prison compound. Months later, Yang died in another prison. All except one American had let him down at the moment he needed their support most urgently. On October 1, 1952, 450 million people celebrated the third anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Here in the U.S., this news is played down or ignored by the press, but among the billion people of Asia, the occasion is historic. They rejoiced when New China lifted the rusted anchor of Western imperialism and threw it on board the exploiter's ship in sending her away. New China demanded equality. In an area where the white man's imperialism is most unpopular, New China's conduct evoked sympathy and support. China is showing other Asians how they, too, can develop their own countries as sovereign states.
China has set an example in agrarian Asia of turning land over to the tillers. More than 300 million people have benefited from this agrarian reform policy in New China. They now produce more through cooperative efforts and by utilizing new techniques taught them by agricultural specialists. And China, which was known for frequent famines, had enough grain last year to ship several hundred thousand tons to famine-stricken India. Last week I read in a local newspaper that Chiang Kai-shek on Taiwan had alerted his guerrillas in China for an attack against the People's Republic. From Taiwan, Chiang's forces would attack the mainland, the report said. Chiang cannot engage in military adventures without U.S. support. I was amused by the article, which said the Taiwanese peasants are working harder and producing more because land rent has been reduced from 50 to 60 percent of the annual crop to 37.5 percent. The Yan'an government reduced rent during the anti-Japanese war and New China has now redistributed the land to the peasants. Chiang is years behind the times, and he sounds stupid to boast of rent reduction on Taiwan when in China land to the tillers has been realized. I also read recently a magazine published by Madame Sun Yat-sen's China Welfare Institute. It is a new periodical started this year, 1952, and it has a fitting name, China Reconstructs. It has many illustrations of the new China, all showing that the vast continental nation has rolled up its sleeves to tackle the gigantic job of educating the illiterate, of producing plenty so that people will not die of recurrent famine as before, and of controlling the floods which had brought sorrow to millions year after year. I was interested in an article written by Fu Tsui titled Ending the Flood Menace. When I was assigned to the guerrilla area in 1944 and 1945, Fu Tsui was a warlord blockading one side of the area I was in. I had stopped in his territory during the period of the Marshal Truce mission. General Fu was under Chiang Kai-shek's thumb and he squeezed the peasants in his area, as did all warlords, and the people despised him. Today, he is a rehabilitated man who believes in social progress and the Minister of Water Conservancy in the People's Republic. His department is in charge of the Huai River project, where about 2,500,000 people are working, removing 16 million cubic yards of earth since work started in November 1950. Earth dikes extending 1,120 miles have been built. I was particularly interested in some of Minister Fu's observations. Our historical records, Fu writes, count no less than 979 floods along the river's course between 246 BC and 1948 AD. In other words, the Huai has produced a flood every two years for some 70 generations. There are three basic conditions making for floods along the Huai. They have always been the same and have been known for centuries. But no one did anything about it. Shang did nothing. He left China in such a state that the July 1950 flood inundated 6,600,000 acres in the Huai area, which has 50 million peasants, or one-third of the population of the United States. Floods are being controlled today, food is ample for the first time, and surplus grain was shipped to India last year during the famine. Today, Admiral Arthur W. Radford is plugging to rehabilitate Chiang by giving him more arms. The U.S. has spent more than $5 billion in military supplies on Chiang since VJ Day, and most of the help was given when he ruled a large part of China. Chiang was repudiated by the Chinese people and only U.S. dollars and assistance have kept him in the global political picture. With Chiang to Formosa went the leeches and warlords, where they are living out of U.S. taxpayers' pockets. The true patriots of China remain, and they are reconstructing the great nation.